Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session. Uh, glad that you came. This is my first talk, so please be patient. Sometimes I may uh, appear a little bit nervous. That's because I am. So uh, let's enjoy it. Hopefully, it's going to be both interesting and educational for you. Uh, if you wish to uh, open the site that's up there, uh, the link to the site is uh, at the schedule. Uh, I linked it uh, into the schedule details, so uh, you can open it and follow the presentation if you, uh, if you wish so. Um, right now, it's going to be just slides, so it's not necessary, but uh, if time permits, we're going to get into some um, R notebooks, and it might be beneficial for you to see the code because I'm not going to stop there for, for too long. Uh, just some details uh, and biography about me. Um, I'm Mark, hello. I'm Associate Software Engineer at Red Hat AI Center of Excellence. My colleague Marcel has the presentation uh, before me. Uh, as far as my skills and languages are concerned, don't worry about that, the time is very precious. Uh, and let's get back, let's get straight to the, to the outline of this, of this talk. So there will be two presentations, open data and Brno data. The, the open data one, um, I'm going to talk about open data in general, and then I'm going to fit it into uh, the data that, that is opened and published by Brno Portal. And then I have prepared some data sets. Uh, there are three data sets, or three main data sets, and some merged into this. Uh, Brno municipality units, where we're going to explore some basic Brno population data, traffic accidents, and Brno crime. Uh, I like, I, I'd like this presentation to be somewhat uh, educational for aspiring data scientists, let's say. Uh, so if you want to play with open data, uh, you have the basic idea how to do that and what it looks like to be working with the data, and also to the public. So you can get some interesting information, perhaps, and hopefully interesting information about Brno. Uh, so let's start. Presentations are... Uh, down there, I have the one open here. Let's start with open data. Um, I've always, I don't say hated, but not very much liked the uh, the introductory question that speaker uh, that speaker asks, but it somehow feels very natural to ask a question here. So, uh, how many of you? Uh, are pretty sure that know what open data is. Okay, that's pretty good. So that's like 10% of people here. Uh, the rest probably categorically refuses to raise their hands or thinks what a stupid question is this. Uh, all right, so let's go to the definition itself. Uh, it's actually defined somewhat. Um, and it should be information published such that it allows for remote access uh, in some machine-readable format and is published under open license. And it also, also should be registered in an open data catalog. All right, that's the definition, but that's not all there is to it. Here are some specific requirements that should be met in order for the data to be open. And we really, really want these requirements to be met as we'll see in the rest of this talk. Uh, we surely want to data, we surely want the data to be available in some machine readable format. We want it to be accessible, not necessarily registered in national open data catalog, but that's a good thing because there is time that you want to link the data together and find the data according to these links. We want it to be created and maintained you know there is a problem and there will be problems, you want to contact the maintainer and ask the questions and well document it. Now believe me, uh, when we get into the uh, Brno data portal, those requirements are not always met and I like to say a few words of criticism afterwards. We'll get to this. So the main requirements, availability, reusability, universal participation, and interoperability. Just remember these. Now, uh, what's not open data? Uh, I want to emphasize 
data in PDF format. Because it's so common, like, right? Uh, people still publish uh, data, even Bernal Portal publishes data in PDF format and claims it to be open. How do you process it? You know, it's very difficult. Also, data in XLS, print formatted format, very common, claimed to be open data, and it's not. All right, uh, also web services. Uh, there is uh, there's a time that uh, the publisher just gives you a link to an API and you know do whatever you do with the data. Sometimes beneficial, but for most purposes, this is not an ideal thing. You want to have some schema, and that schema might not be part of the API. So there is something which is called five stars of open data. It was defined by uh, Tim Barnes Lee, and um, you can read more on that link there. Uh, but basically what it is, is that the first star, we're gonna get into more details in a bit, but the first star is that the data is published uh, under open license. That's the first star. The second star is the data is published under open license and machine-readable format. The third star, machine-readable open format. That's not always the same thing, right? And the fourth and fifth, fifth stars, uh, these are just some very good things to have, like linked data and, um, and some uh, you know, referenced data formats. Now good, okay. So here we go. These are some details about it. Uh, and note that uh, we can consider data to be open for us as a developers uh, since the third star of the data. Usually this means data published in CSV license, uh, CSV format, for example, and MIT license, let's say. Okay, so what are the costs and benefits? of having these, uh, these kind of data. So when we have one star data, me as a consumer, I can look at it, I can print it, I can change the data as I wish, because there is open license, right? And I can share that data with anyone. As a publisher, it's simple, right? You just dump it in there, never, never mind, never care. I don't have to maintain it, I don't do anything with it. It's pretty simple, that's what Bernard Portal does. Uh, then there is uh, sometimes, sorry, sometimes if there's someone from Bernal Portal, I hope they are not waiting outside to punch me or something, but sometimes it's better. Um, okay, so uh, as far as two stars are concerned, we can directly process them because they are in machine readable format. And we can export it into another format. Usually this is not in, uh, in an open format. That could be something like uh, ArtGIS, for example, uh, for geospatial data. This is very common. And as a publisher, it's still quite simple to publish. As far as three stars are concerned, I can manipulate it in any way I like. And as a publisher, you know, there are some consequences to, the, to this. I might need converters because I use proprietary format and I need to convert it into uh, the open machine readable format. Now, four stars are a little bit more interesting. Of course, we can do everything we could at the third stars. But uh, on top of it, we can link it from another place. We can bookmark it. We can reuse parts of the data because the data are linked. Uh, and there are some URIs defined and it's, it's pretty cool, but uh, it's not always necessary for common use cases. Now, uh, there is a consequence for a customer, uh, sorry, consumer, when it comes to this, we need to understand the structure of the RDF graph, of the data, which is not always an easy thing. And as a publisher, uh, well, we need to do some additional stuff, like invest some slicing and dicing, uh, uh, you need to assign the URIs to the data items and fix existing parents if you had it wrong all the time. And the five stars, this is like very precious to have. I've never seen it yet. Uh, 
you can do all sorts of stuff. If you want to dive deeper into this, just uh, knock yourself out. But the most important, uh, you can present arbitrary links here. Uh, also, words of ca caution, uh, you need to deal with those uh, 404-like errors because those links are uh, very often broken. It's hard to ma maintain for the publisher. Uh, you need to invest resources to maintain those links to other, uh, to other data sets, to other web services, and you need to repair them, et cetera, et cetera. This comes at a price. Now, what's the meaning of it, right? Why do we want to have open data anyway? Well, transparency, right? This might be open government, for example. We want to make decisions that are transparent, and we want to provide underlying data why we made those decisions. And we want, to pop, we want the public to trust us, right? The infrastructure. It's important to remember that data might not be just a data set uh, that comes from a service or something or monitoring. It might be IoT devices. And that's, there's plenty of them out there, and we might use this to build the whole infrastructure. Normalization, right? Normalization of the, of the process, of the life cycle. It might come uh, very naturally that we get some data, we put it into some standards, we uh, fulfill, let's say, three stars, stars of the open data, and we publish it, and we give it for feedback, let's say. And we can normalize this process. That's, that's good. We can compare it, the data with reality. We can compare it to other companies. Also, there's the economical aspect. Well, it's uh, very convenient to provide data in that format because this format is usually targeted to developers, usually, or not very you know, uh, unaware people or untouched people by, uh, by data processing. Uh, and if you target those people, I mean, come on public, uh, you might need to invest in creation of PDF files, in design of the data, in, uh, the, in, so that the data was picturesque, right? Likeable. So it's basically very economical to provide data in this part, and you'll be popular among developers because, right, we all like open data and many, many more. For example, uh, it's beneficial for uh, education, right? For me, I like open data solemnly for this part. I like going into the Bruno portal. I like uh, taking a new data set and you know, play with that and check what's the new at Bruno, what's changed, what's worse, what's better, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, uh, do it too. All right, so uh, my call to arms for this presentation, be a curious consumer of the data, be a smart architect, responsible and unaware publisher, forthcoming maintainer, and I hope that you don't think anymore that open data is just a buzzword that you don't really understand. I hope that uh, you don't think anymore that open data is just any data published under open license, you don't like PDFs anymore, and uh, I hope that you don't name your columns with the one sentence, and this is something that I'm uh, going to explain in the next presentation. Uh, I like to take time uh, for FAQ, just one, two questions if you want to, so that you don't forget what you wanted to ask. So please do so if you want. Cool, all right. So let's go to the next presentation. Now, Brno data. This is uh, hashtag Brno2050. Uh, this is something pretty, pretty recent, actually. Uh, it hasn't been very long that Brno started this data.brno portal, and it opened the data. Now, uh, it is an open platform for sharing data. And 
uh, it's designed to be used by public, including citizens, entrepreneurs, students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you open this portal for the first time, uh, you'll see that very clearly, because it's not just a catalog to search your data; uh, it's actually the whole dashboard of applications built upon that data uh, that you can, you know, visually see. Pretty nice, actually. Now, why? Data is our new urban wealth, and we need to use it to full capacity. I like this sentence very much. Uh, data will, for certain, be the driving force, uh, at least for this century, and I think most of the companies are very aware of this, and it's high time that uh, cities uh, start to be aware of this as well, as well as the citizens. Now, where the data comes from, mostly uh, collected by the city itself, either from, uh, either from the smart city project, for example, or by the companies and other providers. Now, what we have here, there's plenty of data, quite a lot, actually. Not enough, though. Uh, so there's economy, health and environment data, transport, people and housing, education, infrastructure, safety, city, uh, and you can find not only data sets there, but also some useful apps, apps and articles. Words of pride, sorry, sorry, <laughs> words of pride. It's a step in the right direction, okay? I think we can all agree to this. Uh, the dashboards are pretty cool. This is something you'd see when you uh, open the Bernard Data portal. Uh, you'll see plenty of those dashboards. When you open them, uh, yeah, I'm gonna say it right now. When you open them, uh, they are mostly built in um, ArtsGIS app, uh, or I think it's called something like this. This is, this is a proprietary uh, software that is not accessible. I think it's not even accessible for students for free, which is very bad, uh, which is, uh, I think uh, very hard, which makes it very hard to reproduce. And in a bit, I'm gonna get uh, into words of criticism where I'm gonna say all of that. Uh, responsible and helpful administrators, that's right. Uh, at least from my perspective, uh, what I've encountered when I was working with that data uh, was I had like three problems on the road and yeah, in one case, it took the guy the whole week to, uh, to respond, but he did, that's, and that's a, good, that's a good thing. It's not common, actually, and he did respond and help me out with, with a problem I had. Uh, by the way, it was, uh, it was a problem that shouldn't be there, but anyway. And now the words of criticism, I, I've always been better at these. Uh, like criticizing things, that's my thing. So there's a few more slides here. Uh, the five-star five standards are not always met. Uh, and I don't want Bernard Data to meet four stars, five stars, but those three stars is like pretty basic. And, any, uh, and even this uh, is a problem sometimes. Data distribution could be better. For example, this. So uh, most of the data in Bernard Portal is in Czech, and it's gonna be there as well as a slide. So unfortunately, um, I don't know how many English-speaking people or non-Czech or Slovak-speaking people are, are here, but I assume a lot. So I'm gonna have to translate a bit. Uh, so this is, for example, the uh, data set that I have for the criminality and the, uh, the first four files there uh, are actually columns. And uh, the data is separated such that there is just a column in the schema that's it's like very relational database-like. And I don't like these kind of things when it comes to uh, publishing a simple data set. You know, it could be just all at one CSV or in this case, XLSX file. But no, they have to split it into five data sets so that we have to invest our time to uh, search the Google how to merge data sets, you know? So, next thing, um, 
the, <laughs> the column names. Um, this is very tricky uh, for developers to deal with. And if you're familiar with R, um, this is the same data set actually, the criminality. Uh, so I just printed out the column names. And as you can see uh, on the line 17, uh, it <laughs> is the whole sentence uh, actually. And it states uh, that it's an um, object that, uh, uh, that uh, the criminal guy was interested in or his relationship with the victim dash text one dash text two or dash text. Very good, like clapping. Um, try to address these, right? If you're working with IDE, some of them can do these. Some of, the, some of them can do these things. But, you know, can you imagine the line that is there? And uh, there could be like 30 columns, and you don't want to rename all of these all the time. It's very annoying. So this. Now, still uh, being at this thing, here's the example how you can address these. Uh, this dead dollar and the column name. Um, and I at least stripped this, the spaces. So uh, the next thing is the poor ontogonality or schema or, or inconsistency of the data, right? Uh, what I just said was it's an object of the criminal guy uh, that the criminal, criminal guy was interested in or his relationship to the victim. Can you imagine working with data like this? You know, you have airbags. Uh, you have a bank mat here. You have a husband here. You have nothing. This NIC thing, that's nothing. Uh, very good. Or at this uh, 261 sentence, there's uh, yellow rays, Indians, Asians, Australians, Aborigines. Right? Cool. And there's still not enough data. You just want to get some data, like uh, I'm going to tell you the, uh, the population data. I couldn't find uh, recent population per municipal units uh, in machine readable format. I had to open uh, the yearly report that is in PDF. I had to uh, search this 60-page uh, PDF file to find those 10 numbers and you know, write that down into so that I could use them. Uh, yeah, there are some plenty of there are still plenty of PDFs there, uh, and sometimes it's too user friendly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a developer. I want to work with the data as a developer, and sometimes. They are cool data sets, like very cool. But all, all that you get is this. So either you, can, you are damn good in uh, image processing, and you can pick these and pull this out, then all right. Uh, and one of the last things um, is built on proprietary software. The SESRI uh, is a company that's specialized in geospatial, special, geospatial data. Uh, they have pretty good software, like very good. But unfortunately, it's not open. And if you want to reproduce, reproduce this, you can't. And most of the data is in Czech language. Oh, uh, yeah, and one of irritating things is, uh, that's here as well is that when you open the app, uh, that is related to some sort of data set, um, there's no link to that data set. There's just the app. You might want to have the link there. Okay, so my call to arms for this, take a look at the apps, uh, see what data is offered, and take your time to explore and play with the data. And of course, give them your feedback, right? Uh, there's this whole red, uh, there's this red button a uh, thing called feedback on their side, just, you know, uh, hit them. Perfect. Uh, so that's for Brno Data. If you have any questions, hit me. 
Yes, please. All right. So the question was, um, how many of the data sets uh, published by Bernard Pearl are actually uh, five stars, four stars, three stars, etc.? Uh, I couldn't possibly answer this. I have no statistics of, of that data. But from my experience, what I can answer is that uh, I haven't encountered four or five star data. Uh, I have encountered in most uh, most cases the three stars three stars data sets, and, and by most cases I mean like uh, 60 70 percent, uh, and the rest like 20 25 percent was the two star. I haven't encountered the uh, the one star data. Everything that is there is obviously under under uh, open license. Uh, unless, uh, unless there is no link from the application <laughs> to the data set. I don't know under which license it is. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question was whether I saved it in Microsoft format, the files. Oh, uh, the, the picture that I showed you, you mean the criminality and the XLSX files. Uh, this is not something that I produced. This is something that I downloaded from uh, the open data, um, uh, sorry, Bernard data portal. So this is just, uh, I haven't done anything with that. So obviously, uh, it's much better to uh, to you know, process it and dump it into CSV or something like that. But oh, uh, open document format. Well, you can do uh, you can do anything what you want with this data. But I think the answer to to the question uh, is that I just downloaded it from the portal and haven't done anything with this. At least as far as this picture is concerned. All right, so hopefully I haven't overlooked uh, anyone else. And uh, we can now, uh, I think we can, right? Uh, we can now get into the data sets itself. Now I was thinking about putting these into, uh, into presentations as well, but then I figured that, you know, uh, most of the guys are developers here. They might want to see the code. They might want to see what it actually looks like to, to be working with this data. And then I, then I decided to embed uh, the whole R notebooks uh, into the website. Uh, so you can see that right there. And um, first, we're going to look at the Brno municipality data, which is uh, Brno population data. Uh, I'm not going to explain the code very much. Uh, I have submitted a few proposals for uh, also R workshops because I'm sort of R uh, advocate. I think it's very uh, overlooked language. It's pretty neat. Uh, actually, I made all, uh, all of this, uh, those websites uh, using R and, and Hugo static generation, uh, by the way. And also these, uh, these uh, visualizations that you'll see are produced in R. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with R, uh, it's a very similar language to, to Python. Uh, it has some aspects of uh, Haskell, and mm, there is a difference from Python that is very significant, and that's incredibly bad variable naming, like incredibly. Uh, those standard functions are called like abbrevi abbreviations like ST, uh, SF, and yeah, that's one thing. But once you get used to it, it's pretty good. Uh, OK, so all those three data sets that I have here I, are actually uh, picked um, so that I could focus um, on geospatial data, uh, which is something that the S3 does. And I wanted to show you that you can work with geospatial data uh, in an open standards as well. And you can do that on your own. 
and I got 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Uh, so first thing you usually do uh, is, you know, you just want to see the distribution of the data somehow. So you dump this uh, stupid uh, box plot, which is sometimes very clever, by the way, but uh, it's very easy presentation, uh, which visualization. And uh, this is what it looks like in uh, uh, municipal units. The population is uh, distributed. The median is somewhere around 10,000 people. And by municipal units, uh, I mean, you know, the, uh, the parts of Brno. Now, uh, we want to be more specific. We usually proceed from uh, general information to more specific information. And in this case, uh, we want to see uh, how many people are there actually, right? So the good way to do this is to produce a bar chart. Now, from this we can immediately see that the Brno Center, uh, which is the very tall one, uh, is the, has the highest population value. Now, uh, when we want to present the, uh, those kind of charts to, to public, we want to color them, right? And we want to we want to uh, figure out the best way to color these. So what I usually do, I use something called Jenks uh, natural split approach, and I split the data unless there is some underlying factor or feature that I can color the data uh, based on. Uh, if I have something like this, I usually split the data uh, in a few uh, categories, let's say categories, so in a few parts. In this case, you can see the splits here, and we color them. Right, and uh, for for Brno guys, it's not surprising that uh, Brno Center uh, has the the highest population. Uh, then there is the Brno North, uh, Brno Lichen, etc. Now, for me, interesting part is plotting the things uh, on the map. So we get the Brno base map. Now, going back to Brno Data Portal and Open Data. This is not an easy thing. Brno does not publish the shape files for those, for those maps. And it's kind of hard to get these, but with, uh, with an effort, you can get the shape files for the Czech Republic, and then you can somehow, somehow filter these out. You can color these based on the population. You can make the colors more beautiful and add legend. You can add labels. And what I usually do is when I'm adding the labels, I also want to make labels a little bit symbolic. So I use the, uh, the alpha uh, increase to show the most valuable labels there. In this case, that's the population. So that would be uh, the municipality uh, visualization. Uh, if you're into uh, another colors, use them, right? No problems. Now it might be also interesting in Area size, right? Uh, or we can visualize this on the map as well. We can visualize population density. And the reason why I'm hearing so much is because I have so, much, so less time, and this is the least interesting data set. But what's interesting in this, and I want to point it out, is the Kepler GL. Uh, for anyone uh, having something to do with, with spatial data, this is an incredible tool. It's incredibly easy to use. Uh, I would show you demo if I have time, uh, if I had time, but uh, I don't. Uh, but you can sort of plot it in this pseudo 3D, and it's very good. Uh, use it, check out the demo. You'll produce visualization like this very easily from CSV files, JSON files, uh, GeoJSON files. Pretty neat. All right. Uh, then there are tra traffic, and, uh, traffic incidents. I'm going to skip these uh, because I have last four minutes. And I'm going to go to the most interesting, at least in my opinion, most interesting um, visualization, and that's Brno criminality. Because I think that's uh, something that we can all relate to, nevertheless, you're from Brno uh, or not. So I'm just going to slide through this. This is leaflet, by the way. If, you're, if you've ever uh, used it in JavaScript, you can use it in R as well. And it has pretty neat visualization. And uh, in this case, it provided us um, 
it provided us a new view on, on those traffic incidents, uh, we would expect that the highest uh, population in the Brno Center would cause highest, uh, or not cause, but have some, uh, have some correlation with the uh, highest traffic incidents. But it appears that there are actually some parts of Brno that are, uh, let's say, more dangerous. And uh, we would figure this out in this, in this notebook. So if you want to, uh, or try it yourself, check it out. And the Brno crime. All right, this is an interesting one. Uh, I like it very much. Um, although the data is uh, very unpolished, uh, you can see the examples. There's exactly this data set. It's not very good, uh, but has interesting information. Uh, and it's published from, uh, I think, Czech Republic Police or just Brno Police Department, uh, some of this. Uh, this is thumbs up. Uh, it's very good that uh, those public authorities publish their data. And it's interesting data. Uh, you can see, actually, that uh, this is, uh, by the way, data set from 2016, I think. And uh, those are crimes uh, when they were committed. So in 2016, they actually found out that there was a crime committed before 1990. Now, good job. Now, if we zoom into these, uh, what I found interesting here, for example, is those spikes uh, at the beginning of the year. I don't know, it's like, you know, criminals take some uh, New Year <laughs> resolutions or something. <laughs> uh, okay. Colors and by, by seasons, for example. I like colors. Uh, you could tell that. Uh, so, you know, why not to color these with seasons? Uh, what we can see here, for example, is that there are uh, higher spikes in, in winter, and there are more, more spikes in spikes in spring. Spring. <laughs> uh, that's interesting too, but it somewhat, uh, you know, spring and winter both are at the beginning of the year, so maybe there's a correlation there. Now, what I think is interesting uh, is the crime by category. Um, I had to handpick these categories. They don't have it uh, implicitly there, so I had to do some text processing to, uh, to pick those, those categories. So I picked these. And uh, most of the crimes are caused by robbery or, uh, are robbery or burglaries. And uh, you can see that this is a pretty, pretty high amount. Uh, then there are uh, the blue ones are drugs, uh, vandalism, for example. Uh, and other criminal activities. Now, what's good that in Brno we don't have much violent crime. You can see that there, was, uh, there wasn't even a single murder, I think, which is pretty cool. Now, uh, if we slide through this damage caused by crime incidents uh, and do some outlier analysis, we could see that there are some incredible outliers there. Uh, damage in 12.5 uh, million crowns. That's pretty neat. Uh, so I want to visualize these, so I took a quantile uh, and I got rid of these outliers. And you can see that most of the incidents are uh, up to 25,000 crowns, which is about $1,000 in Brno. And uh, for those who are, who are from Brno, uh, it's not very unexpected that the highest criminality uh, and the highest density of crimes is in uh, Komarov or Zhidenice, uh, and also Brno Center is doing pretty well here. But what I found interesting was that when I plot uh, the damage caused by crime incidents with respect to the number of, of crime incidents, uh, which is the, the comparison is right here, is that actually the, uh, the thieves are very crafty and in uh, in, I think that's, there is high damage and less number of crimes in Brno Center. So uh, the, themes, the thieves or the um, criminals can do more damage with, uh, with less incidents. So they are more crafty, I guess. Uh, okay, so what are the stolen goods here? I'm running out of time, but we're um, on the end of this presentation already. So I hope that's gonna be good. Now, uh, you know, by stolen goods, robbery or burglary, uh, fraud and vandalism are the most common in this case. 
And what, what, uh, what about the municipality units? Uh, that's uh, what I was talking about. Uh, the left one, Komarov. Uh, the middle is the Brno Center and the Brno uh, All of them have a, no a high number of crimes. Uh, most of them robberies and frauds, and also some financial and economical criminal acts. And um, we can plot these as well. Take your time to explore it. I'm going to go to the end of this presentation, which is my favorite visual visualization as word cloud. Uh, although there are people that think this is pretty old school, I like this so much. And uh, there, are about, there were about 240 uh, objects that thieves were most interested in. Uh, and if I uh, used bar charts, it would be difficult to explore these unless you use some sort of interactive visualizations. But word clouds do a pretty good job here. And you can see that, obviously, the uh, people who are mo most interested in money. This is the Penisa thing. Uh, bags, iPhones, uh, credit cards, personal items, uh, mobiles, computers, and that stuff. And if we color it by the damage done, uh, money. Uh, this comes from the financial frauds. There were some uh, huge outliers there uh, in the millions, uh, bags and iPhones. And uh, what we can do, and I find it particularly interesting, is that you can play with this and you can shape it, this word clouds. And uh, what I did is I uh, applied some rotation to these and shaped it. And I shaped it into uh, this Brno city uh, emblem. So that's, you cannot say this is old school, right? This is pretty neat. OK. So that's it. I'm sorry that I couldn't finish all of the data sets. Um, we can take a few minutes for questions and answers. Yes, please. Oh yeah, that's true. So you're saying that uh, when I introduced the criminality, uh, and I told that uh, in 2016 they actually discovered that the crime was committed in 1990, it's because uh, it just introduced a different uh, a different storage. So it's depicted in this uh, particular data set, not because uh, they discovered it, but because they just archived it in that way. Yeah, thank you. Might be the case, of course. Question here. Uh, so when I went to the data, Bruno just said, uh, I'm familiar with the passport of force and wealth, good news and everything. Uh, but I see no data there. So if you can help me, uh, you can go to this to the website. Data Bruno? Data Bruno just to that. All right. I'm looking for what? <laughs> so there is some data claim. If you go to the details, there's no data at all. Uh, but the license is open. <laughs> Great input. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I don't know what it states in this uh, long description. I guess it doesn't state that the data is missing. Uh, so yeah, that happens. Uh, that happens quite a lot. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know. This, uh, this is similar to why the, uh, so, so by the way, just for repeat, there is no data, right? Um, this sometimes happen, uh, happens. This sometimes happens when you uh, go from the application dashboard to the data it points to, if it points to anything, and you don't find the data there. So yeah, uh, thank you for the input. Uh, you can see that uh, it's pretty easy to find out that 
there is no data linked. Um, yeah, you can file it. There's the thing called feedback uh, that I was talking about, and just you know, uh, link this uh, this uh, wells data set and. The first one? Yeah, the first one. Uh, so if I want to uh, download the whole data as GeoJSON, uh, how do I do that? <laughs> uh, that's another thing. You can re request the format in, in which the data is. I mean, if you, if you go to the, to the map, so, uh, uh, yeah, so. Oh, OK. Oh yes, this is. Oh yes, this is particularly interesting. Um, a lot of data sets uh, from Bruno Data are linked to ArtSkis, um, ArtSkis portal. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> I don't know why, but it links to a description of the data, not to the data itself. So what I usually did is there is, um, I cannot remember remember exactly, but sometimes those uh, links up here uh, work and give you something like this, for example. Oh, this is the same thing in JSON, okay. Uh, yeah, but what I usually did was there's uh, something called artskis open data dot something, and you find uh, this data set there. So they just point you to the description of the data set, not to the data, self, not to the data itself, and you have to hope that you'd be lucky and find the data on the artskis open data portal. And uh, also, it happens sometimes that you don't, and that's because there is some uh, link between Artskis portal and Brno portal. They collaborate together somehow, and that is what happened to me as well. I wanted to, uh, I requested Brno for their uh, transport data, because they, had, they have the application for the uh, transport data. They have it visualized. They say it's from Artskis. Uh, or uh, any any other any other company, and they refused. So that can happen too. They just uh, publish the visualization of the data, but they do not give you the data itself. That sometimes happens. Yeah, there's plenty of bugs like this, and uh, that's what what motivated me to uh, give that presentation on open data. Uh, you know, it's the step in the right direction, but it's a very small step and sometimes you fall along the path. Can I, one last question, okay. I don't think that five star data defines uh, language, uh, but um, I can't even remember if the license, no, license does not imply language. I don't think so. It's just, uh, so the question was whether uh, there is a normalized language for the data to be open. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think there is, but it's, uh, I'd say use common sense, right? Uh, if you want to target Czech people, okay. But uh, sometimes it happens that even Czech people want to use that data and distribute it to uh, non, non uh, or foreign countries or non Czech speaking persons. So it's always a good way, either uh, if you want to target Czech people, you know, uh, publish both. Publish English, publish uh, English. English is, of course, generally uh, the language of choice. Publish both. Publish Czech and publish, uh, publish English. English. Or give us some way to uh, at least script or something to uh, process that check data and translate it into, uh, into, into English, for example. There can be a simple dictionary-like dictionary -like structure, for example. I've seen this before, and it's better than nothing. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>